The application and practice of ritual magic is found within the vast canon of Celtic, Nordic and Slavic mythology. And this is contained within an archive of folklore and epics stretching back to the earliest Indo-European and Proto-European world of the distant past. Along with this, there is also a strong cultural overlay for this mythology within the mysteries and the anomalies of the surviving megalithic structures of Western Europe. What is it precisely about such places which affects many of us so deeply? What causes an encounter with, say, a dolmen or a stone circle to unleash within us tantalizing hints of something we may have forgotten? Yet, at the same time, something we also feel strangely compelled to remember. Within the English-speaking world, Celtic and in Norse mythology in particular, when examined in tandem with the great stone monoliths and mysterious landscapes of Western Europe, represent the primary mode of the spiritual and ritual magic that hold the memories of past cultures, both traumatic and historical, within the overall Western European psyche. Later, the further adoption of allegory, metaphor, and on towards more complex systems of ceremonial magic, which first came out of Neolithic society and was kept alive for thousands of years until the arrival of Christianity in Europe, which in and of itself became something of a psychic cataclysm for the communities it affected, all of whom had been previously pagan, nature or cosmic based spiritual traditions. From this point on, they had to cast off their numerous gods, goddesses and nature deities in order to serve the important one through God of the Middle East, under an increasingly centralized worldview. However, within folklore and agrarian traditions, magic continued to function and central to this magical and spiritual approach was the association of these folk traditions and ceremonial rites with certain megalithic sacred sites or special landscapes. Later pre-Christian festivals would be fused into this world of folklore and tradition, many of which came to be seen as intrinsically Christian festivals, such as Easter and All Saints Day being based upon the Celtic festival of Samhain. This continuation of magical and spiritual interconnectivity continued on into the European Enlightenment in the 18th century. This was mainly held by Freemasons, antiquarians and numerous occult societies. From this, over the centuries and up until the present, numerous revivals of the European mystical and spiritual or magical tradition have taken place, and it must be said with surprising success and continuing endurance, as pagan revival and neo-pagan movements continue to grow and flourish. This is due in part to a sense of psychic animism, a longing for a past which arises within some people more than others. Despite almost 2,000 years of Europe being under the influence of Christianity, Islam and Atheism, this desire to return to the old religions, spirituality and mystical traditions of the ancient Europe has never waned and has only nested itself further within the most surprising of individuals and situations. One such individual was John Foster Forbes, who having been exposed to a megalithic site near his childhood home, recognized instinctively that there was something about such places 
which held far deeper secrets than what archaeologists and historians could apply to them. At the heart of John Foster Forbes' philosophy and work lies his admirable contention that the subjects of archaeology and anthropology should not be held exclusively within the interests of a limited group of academics and experts, and that such topics belong to everyone to explore and to examine for themselves. His belief was that these twin fields of science were far too important towards discovering the origins of humanity so as to remain within the exclusive possession of an elite circle who alone controlled their narratives. In the preface to his book from the late 1930s entitled Age is Not So Dark, Being an Anthropological Retrospect of Britain and the Extreme West of Europe, to give the book its full title, was Forbes basically expressing, in rather naive and charmingly enthusiastic language it must be said, what was essentially many of the ideas which would be put forth by authors with similar topics of Atlantis, Giants, the West to East Civilization counter theory, electromagnetic effects of megalithic stones, ancient technology, and the importance of mythology relating to attaining a more holistic insight into Neolithic and Bronze Age stone structures, and along with this, psychometry, and the use of mystical science in visualizing the ancient past. Forbes' ideas and theories were eventually to be fleshed out in his later writings following the horrors of the Second World War and the onset of the Atomic Age, and from this the emerging Cold War. In his book Age is Not So Dark, Foster Forbes presents a work that was to predict the future in terms of how people would eventually come to see the megalithic structures of Britain, Ireland and Western Europe in terms of being cohesive remnants of a lost civilization that owed more to the development of another Europe of the past which has long been forgotten. In many ways, Forbes can be seen as the bridge between the work of antiquarians such as William Stukeley and more contemporary megalithic researchers such as Julian Cope. Considering that we are dealing with a work from well before the rise of the New Age and alternative spiritual movements, John Foster Forbes can indeed be seen as a man well ahead of his time. The intensity of war often brings about magical ways of thinking that would not otherwise be tolerated and accessible, as such ideas would find themselves during peacetime. The necessity for both personal and collective survival brings up ancient ghosts of the primitive past, of the shadow psyche, which have been securely locked beneath the civilized surface during more peaceful, tranquil, and stability-infused days, long before constant death and destruction comes knocking upon one's door. Our detachment from all manner of debt means that we as modern people can entertain notions that we are both reasoned and logical, and as the conformity of placidity affords us a kind of shelter from the irrational. However, as soon as the horrors of wars and possible violent death arrive, we can be so quickly transported back to the status of what some might term superstitious savagery. Suddenly, we are not so very different from our ancient ancestors after all when we had previously taken comfort in evaluating them as less educated and sophisticated than our own present self-image. There is also something about war that brings up other sensations pertaining to the overall survival of the human race and how we manage to survive as a species the traumatic episodes of our ancient and not so ancient past. Recounting the tales of Jericho's walls and the submergence of Atlantis, 
likewise gives us hope that our society around us is torn asunder, that we too shall prevail and go on, as survivors of previous cataclysms have done so in the past. After all, there is no difference between a city being consumed by bombs and incendiary devices than that of an ancient city being submerged beneath the waves. Only the specifics of the annihilation differ. Such fears drove J. or Tolkien to build his own survival mythologies in the trenches of the Somme as part of his personal attempts to prevent the end of the Age of Men from coming to pass with the onslaught of mechanized warfare, poison gas, flamethrowers and other forms of emerging military pathological sorcery. And so it was in London at the height of the Blitz, starting in September 1940, when the German Luftwaffe for 57 consecutive nights reduced over 1 million London homes to rubble, and which killed over 40,000 civilians during an operation, which also targeted several other British cities and seaport towns. As the sound of the air raid sirens began to fill the nightscape of British cities, among the terrified and vulnerable civilian population, the desire for survival unleashed a psychic firestorm that manifested in the revival of religious and spiritual salvation and many, many old superstitions too. Among the educated and middle classes, the world of the metaphysical and esoteric tapped into this wartime charge in the form of magicians, cranks, oddballs, eccentric artists and other queer characters dodging the German bombs and incendiary devices while finding that the heightened psychological and emotional state of the time was allowing them to indulge in their own craft and conjurations with a sense of almost religious freedom, as if the English witchcraft laws had been temporarily set aside in light of their wartime conditions. One can only imagine how a person making their way through the burning streets of London during the late night hours and then submerging into the safety of the subterranean world of the London Underground, where thousands took refuge, that each one would be existing in a kind of Dante's Inferno of the modern consciousness. Within such conditions, a tremendous psychic charge is unleashed, and this then becomes the fodder of magic and mysticism born out of mayhem. While there was a rationing of food and other forms of energy during the blitz-laden months of 1940 and 1941, there was also a veritable cornucopia of magical, paranormal, metaphysical and spiritualist forms of energy unleashed for anyone a wishing to avail of such queer indulgences once they did not get in the way of the Ministry of Defence and infringe upon wartime secrets. As this was the case with Scottish spiritualist Helen Duncan, when, in 1940, she brought forth, during a seance, perfectly accurate information concerning the sinking of the Royal Navy's elite warship HMS Hood. And before the event was even made public due to the huge loss of life and the potential effect on public morale, her abilities brought her to the attention of Brigadier Roy C.E. Firebrace, head of military intelligence for Scotland, who confirmed her information as legitimate mediumship and not that of a Nazi spy, as had been previously suspected. However, she was still to find herself eventually imprisoned under the Witchcraft Act in Holloway Prison for her powers as a medium. It was during this same time, while German bombs rained down upon London that the great beast 666 himself, Alistair Crowley, was drafting and redrafting, altering and changing rough proofs of the Thought Tarot Deck artwork with visionary artist lady Farida Harris at Crowley's lodgings at 93 Jerham Street, London. On the other side of this now burning great metropolis, the brilliant artist, author and occultist Austin Osmond Spare found himself badly injured and homeless after a Luftwaffe bomb had destroyed his apartment and all his artwork only to find the experience inspirational as he embarked upon his creative works and research into the occult. Another occultist, Dion Fortune, and her magical order, the Fraternity of Inner Light, began a series of meditations in an attempt to defeat the Third Reich within the magical battlefield of the astral realms 
having taken heed of Scottish journalist, folklorist and occult scholar Lewis Spence in his book entitled Occult Causes of the Present War. Magic was everywhere in wartime Britain, just as it had been in pre-war Germany. The charge had been passed, the spell had been cast, and the magical war was on. And from this, incendiary thoughts and streams of consciousness from deep within inside certain individuals was to tap into the same streams of psychic energy that had flowed all the way from Atlantis to the present. Far from the flaming streets and mountainous rubble of wartime London, along the Scottish Borders region, in the historic country of Peebleshire, John Foster Forbes, from his home at Solway Cottage, was engaged in correspondence with the Council for Prehistoric Research at Caxton Hall, on the corner of Caxton Street and Palmer Street in Westminster in London. This still standing structure is an ornate Francois Fourst style edifice of red brick and pink sandstone and some architectural know that has to be said and also a building with an interesting pedigree of its own within the world of the mystical and spiritual. Nestled between Big Ben and Buckingham Palace, Caxton Hall was a major player in the birth of the British Suffragette League as well as hosting none other than Alistair Crowley and his coven in late 1910 when they performed the rites of Eleusius, and which was described by the press at the time as being a display of blasphemy and erotic suggestion. Not long before John Foster Forbes was attempting to procure a possible lecture opportunity with the Council of Prehistoric Research at Caxton Hall, in order to present his own research and finding into what he believed was the true nature of the Aboriginal Britons as he called them, that none other than Michael O'Dwyer, the former Lieutenant Governor of the Punjab in India, was assassinated by the Indian nationalist Undham Singh in retaliation for the 1919 Amritsar massacre. Due to this event and the conditions of the wartime realities, Forbes would have to suffer delay after delay in presenting his findings to the Council for Prehistoric Research. It would not be the first time his appeal but representation was to be ignored or even ridiculed. However, this psychometric Atlantean from Aberdeenshire was not going to be silenced either, as his life had been up until this point one of almost maverick unconventionality, especially considering the social order and overriding class system of British society during his life and times. Foster Forbes would in time deliver his Westminster lectures on what he believed to be the true nature of his Aboriginal Britons. Rothamay Castle in Aberdeenshire, in the northeast of Scotland, was originally the seat of the Abernathys family, and the castle played a central role in the history of Scotland during turbulent times of nationalistic and religious wars, having at one time provided shelter to none other than Queen Mary. Originally dating from the 15th century, Rothy May Castle was reconstructed and refurbished as a Scottish baronial manor house in 1788 by James Duff, the second Earl of Fife. Resplendent with conical roof turrets, labyrinthine, lower level of servants' quarters and cellars, the impressive and picturesque L-shaped building was composed of massive field boulders, and it was perhaps the young John Foster Forbes, being surrounded by such impressive examples of masonry, perhaps even some coming from nearby megaliths, during his early childhood that his interest in the hidden quality and phenomena of stone took root before he began to explore the many Aberdeenshire, Neolithic and Bronze Age stone circles beyond the confides of the castle itself. When John Foster Forbes was born under the sign of Taurus in 1889, the British Empire had reached the zenith of its power and global influence. The wider world was changing as well, and also re-examining itself as the old imperial structures were giving way to the oncoming realities of the approaching 20th century. Along with John Foster Forbes in 1889, Adolf Hitler and Charlie Chaplin were also born within weeks of each other. The Austro-Hungarian Empire was still reeling from the bizarre double suicide of Rudolf, Crown Prince of Austria, and his mistress, the Baroness Mary Faserta. 
while an almost literal antithesis to this decline of the old traditions, the Coca-Cola Company began its operations. The Eiffel Tower was opened and an artist named Vincent van Gogh began painting his masterpiece Starry Night, which would herald the transition between traditional and modern art, if not hinting at a quantum world below that of the material five-sense reality. 1889 could not have been a more appropriate year for a man to be born who would have fused the past, present and future, such as John Foster Forbes. Following his public school education and time at university in Cambridge, Foster Forbes enlisted as an intelligence officer in the army and subsequently served in World War I. Although little is known of his wartime experiences, his capacity as both an intelligence officer as well as his exposures to the horrors of the Great War may have played a significant part in later changes in his psychological and emotional well-being, as well as the depth of his investigations and research into things less prosaic and materialistic. Following the war, Forbes found employment as a boys' school headmaster and took charge of his own catering college, which proved to be unsuccessful. Forbes was known for chain smoking the sun cured and highly aromatic Murad brand of Turkish cigarettes, with their high nicotine and tar content, and ironically featuring the artwork of megaliths and mysticism, which adored both the brand's advertisements and cartons. Foster Forbes was also reported as being something of an enthusiastic drinker at the time. It was also during this period when Foster Forbes' growing interest in prehistoric mysteries and megalithic sites really began to grab hold of his imagination as he had devoured every text on the topics he could lay his hands upon. Being as comfortable with academic volumes as with the more esoteric and pseudo-historical works of the period, John Foster Forbes began to develop his own model of the ancient world and this was to remain with him for the rest of his life. As he constantly refined and solidified his theories, and ideas of the ancient world of the megalithic builders of Britain, Ireland and beyond. Essential to this was the numerous Pictish and other early Neolithic Bronze Age sites of his home county of Aberdeenshire. In the 1920s, John Foster Forbes was overcome by a serious illness, which appears to have been a result of either post-war traumatic stress or a nervous breakdown due to some other unknown factors which would have almost certainly killed him but was to become a personal experience which Forbes was to look upon as some kind of mystical or psychedelic experience. While at the deep end of a psychological turmoil and poor personal health, a group calling themselves the Order of the Cross entered into his life and ostensibly saved him during his darkest hour demonstrating remarkable compassion and attention to Forbes' predicament, which was to profoundly change his outlook on life. Founded in 1904, the Order are dedicated to living a life of compassion and to follow a pacifist and vegetarian way of life. The Fellowship offers support and encouragement to all who would embrace its aims and ideals. This was the creation of a fellow Scot by the name of John Todd Ferrier, of which very little is known even to this day, although the Order itself is still very much in existence. Their mission is one of Christian mysticism and vegetarianism, coupled with a strong sense of pacifism. Inspired by the writings of John Todd Ferrier and by the compassion and understanding of the Fellowship, John Foster Forbes found the support and encouragement he needed in order to survive his psychological and spiritual breakdown, having been impressed by the group's active encouragement of his own creative and personal interests. Having himself quite literally risen from the dead, Foster Forbes joined the Order of the Cross and began to publish and lecture on his theories of prehistory, which he claimed to be the magnificent cultural achievements of the Celtic, Pictish and Aboriginal Britons, all within the framework of the Order's philosophy. Forbes not, had not only found the vigour to embark on bringing his theories of Western Europe prehistory to the masses, but he also found himself a comforting and supporting framework within the Order of the Cross, so as to bring it to the world at large. And central to this was his absolute and near evangelical devotion to the concept that the Atlantic myth of Plato was real and had taken place within the megalithic arc of Western Europe. 
To his credit, Forbes generally steered well clear of more British Israelism inclined historical revisionism of the era, such as that of William Coimes Beaumont, who, unlike Forbes, had a major public profile being a well-respected journalist writing for the British newspaper The Daily Mail. Coimes Beaumont's status within British society made him very much part of the social and intellectual elite when he claimed that Edinburgh and Scotland was the actual site of Jerusalem and that the English city of Bristol was the real Sodom of the Bible. While Coimes Beaumont theories on Atlantis being located somewhere in the British Isles do indeed have some serious merit, it was also constantly undermined by the biblical overlay. To his credit though, John Foster Forbes avoided British Israelism and maintained and stuck by his belief that the civilization, high culture and technological achievements of the Neolithic builders of Europe owed nothing to the tales and characters from the Holy Land. What made Foster Forbes' work and research stand out compared to his peers was his hands-on approach to field work and constant visits and surveys of the megalithic sites. Although he was generally a solitary individual during most of his life, Foster Forbes gathered around him a team of fellow researchers who may well have fallen out of the pages of an Agatha Christie Miss Marple novel, with names such as Major F.C. Tyler, Commander Wentworth Grist, Mr. Stanley Barber, Miss Iris Campbell, and most important of all, the human television set herself, Miss Olive Pixley. Miss Pixley and Campbell provided the skills used to psychometrize stones at ancient and historical locations and from this would channel or present their psychic impressions of memories and experiences contained within the subatomic structures and electromagnetic and quartz qualities of the stones. If his writings are anything to go by then Forbes held the work of these two women in the highest regard and considered their psychic impressions to be valuable data for determining missing parts of the prehistorical record. Forbes believed, and in the years since his heyday he has been proven correct, that the people of prehistory were far more sophisticated, cultured and technologically adept than had been portrayed by academia, and that an injustice which results from this narrow and simplistic, if not bigoted worldview, robs both the people of the ancient past of their own dignity, and we of the present of pride in the achievements of our very ancient ancestors. Forbes considered it lamentable that history was never our story, belonging to the average man and woman, and one which they should take a personal pride in being connected to. Foster Forbes rightly believed that the downgrading of the ancient Britons in order to elevate the magnificence of the later Roman period was at the root of this issue. He strongly believed that once people looked into the history of the megalithic builders of their own accord and without the strict framework of prevailing academic orthodoxy, the day too would come to the same conclusion as Forbes had himself. What made John Foster Forbes truly visionary in his work was that he implemented a holistic methodology of incorporating, along with archaeology and anthropology, data collected from folklore, superstitions, customs and mythology in order to decode and reveal the evolution and eventual dispersion of the original Europeans of the Atlantic regions in prehistory. Even today this is considered something of a radical approach by mainstream historians and yet it has been shown time and time again to be a valuable source of information in uncovering new revelations concerning the ancient past. Forbes expressed amazement that this was not standard practice among academics and he was perfectly legitimate in expressing such concerns. In recent times, research programs in both the UK and Portugal have revealed the extent and depth of information contained within European folklore that offers up consistent archetypes and tropes which have been determined to go as far back as the Bronze Age and perhaps even further into prehistory. John Foster Forbes came from a time when most educated people believed that there was essentially no history at all prior to the early years of the Roman Empire and certainly there was no history at all on the Atlantic fringes of Europe despite the incredible and numerous Neolithic structures of profound antiquity stretching along the megalithic arc from Scandinavia down through the British Isles along the northern coasts of France into Spain and Portugal and around the Mediterranean as far as Malta and Sicily. 
In his later book, The Unchronicled Past, Foster Forbes presents this philosophy and revision of ancient history and the initial run of 500 copies sold out almost immediately, giving him encouragement to continue his mission to restore pride in the legacy of the Aboriginal Britons and to resurrect Atlantis from the depths and present it to the public within a new light. This was not cold and hard historical information, but a vibrant and positive and above all exciting delivery to people who, at the time, were enthusiastically willing to embrace it in far greater numbers than even Forbes himself had initially believed. In 1936 and 37, Foster Forbes delivered a series of now lost 20 minute radio talks giving a brief outline of his theories and findings. This then became the launch pad for his career as a maverick antiquarian. However, everyone agreed that John Foster Forbes, through his writing and lectures, brought the ancient history of the Aboriginal Britons and other ancient races alive, and his ethos and methodology was in time to be emulated by many other authors, even if his work and legacy has all but sadly been forgotten. One of the more disgraceful treatments of his work was when Forbes presented his major research and comprehensive surveys on the early pre-Roman history of London's waterways, which the BBC claimed to have lost and has never been recovered. Fake news and censorship is hardly anything new in this world of mainstream media. Among John Foster Forbes' theories, he was the first to propose that the Irish and Scots were the same race as the Celt-Iberians of Spain and Western Portugal, having correctly identified the Neolithic structures of these regions having been built by the same race and at the same time. He was a strong believer in the existence of giants during prehistory and set about proving his theories decades before such ideas became popular outside biblical scholarship. He was also the proponent of a most interesting theory that the original builders of the megaliths became caught up in a dark occult religion and this sorcery is what unleashed the disasters which caused the destruction of Atlantis. Following this, a new school of druids arrived with the intention of restoring this path of light to the stone circles and dolmens. Their efforts helped to stabilize this five sense reality and end all this turmoil. Foster Forbes also warned that dark occult forces of the present are still attempting to corrupt the megaliths of Europe for their own ends. In fact, in his book, The Castle and Place at Rothame, Forbes recalls an early childhood experience when an influential friend of his father generated something of a psychic attack in the young man while the aristocrat joked about human sacrifices being held at nearby Neolithic stone circles. One of his more highly intriguing theories is that Forbes spoke of something he termed a literal Freemasonry, which puts forward the idea that it is the nature of dry stone construction which allows megalithic structures to survive for millennia. That rather than these stones just being randomly piled one upon the other, each stone within a megalithic structure, no matter how small or numerous, belongs in a very specific place. Forbes cited the example of dry stone walls used in field boundaries and their ability to last hundreds of years, as the farmers carefully choose specific stones for certain points in the wall. Forbes believed that masonry using cement mortar was always doomed to falling apart, but dry or loose stones develop a relationship to one another like a sympathetic resonance of musical notes. These relationships are fine-tuned to not only last thousands of years, but also to transmit psychometric information to people who can read the messages contained within the stones as long as the structures remain intact. Indeed, the excavations of Navan Fort in Ulster during the 1970s surprised the archaeologists as it was shown that a distinct geometry was present on the main dome structure, even though it was composed of many thousands of seemingly random stones. Every one of these small stones appeared to be in a specific place in that precise location, suggesting that some level of psychic connection exists between the stones, the local environment in which they are situated, and the individuals who place the stones in such specific places 
and in a specific manner. An unseen force fusing all these elements together as one, with the underlying psychic cement being that of magic. Decades later, in the 1983 edition of none other than the vanguard of scientific orthodoxy, the New Scientist magazine, there was an article based on a major study of the roll white stones in England. One part of a complex of three Neolithic and Bronze Age monuments in the heart of the English Midlands. The objective of the initial study was to locate if there were any detectable magnetic forces at the Rollwright Stone Circle itself. The research was conducted by an engineer by the name of Charles Brooker, who created a magnetrometer survey of the circle. What Brooker discovered was how bands of magnetic forces became attracted to the Rollwright Stone Circles, itself by means of a narrow gap in the entrance. Even more incredibly, this energy seemed to relay from one stone to the other before circling in a spiral into the center of the circle and vanishing completely, as if into another reality. John Foster Forbes, half a century previously, had discovered something very similar himself, that these are called portal dolmens for a reason, that these stone circles are the earliest forms of European magic and represent the initial engagement of the European consciousness with that of the occult magic and sorcery, and the legacy of such continues to the very present and has manifested in numerous and incredible ways in all the centuries ever since.